Hello everybody and welcome to your next installment of Kick. Now, last time, um, Buddy handed his uncle into the dragon and the uncle agreed to do a job for him. So, let's see what happens now. The next chapter is called House of Sand. I'm lying on the beach. My whole body aches. Waves crash onto the shore with such force I can feel them through the sand. The vibrations hurt my tired muscles. I know that if I'm lying on a beach, I must have made it. I can't be dead or drowned because I can feel the wind scattering sand over my face. I keep my eyes closed. The pain in my limbs is almost enjoyable. It means I kept kicking. I'm not dead yet. Another wave folds onto the shore. It must be a big one because I sink further into the sand. Little grins scurry across my shoulder like insects. I try to pull myself up, but I'm too heavy and the sand is too loose. I start to panic. Someone calls my name and I really panic. If someone knows my name, it means I didn't make it. I must have passed out and been washed up on the same island I swam from. And that's almost worse than being dead. The voice comes again and another wave crashes in. It must be really big, tsunami big, because I feel like I'm falling through the sand with the impact of it. The sand rushes over my face, filling up my ears and nose and mouth. I know that I don't open my eyes and get out, I will die, but I just can't find the surface. My voice is called again. It sounds strange though, through the sand. Someone reaches through the grains and pulls me up. But I thrashed around. I don't want to face the wave. It's too big. It's too strong. It will sweep me away. Buddy, wake up. We need to get out. I open my eyes and immediately scrunch them shut against the grit. It's raining dust from the ceiling. Stop shaking me, I say. I'm awake. Buddy! It's Mum's voice, but not like I've ever heard it before. And then I notice another sound, a rumbling, near and loud and gro gro growing, like the world is hurting. I wipe a hand over my face and the little grains grate against my skin. Shielding my eyes from the dusty light, I look up. The crack in the ceiling spreads in every direction and zigzags down the walls like a giant, like a giant is t tearing the room apart. Mum grabs my arm and I scramble out of the bed. I stumble on the shaking ground. The earth lurches, throwing me onto my hands and knees. From outside, I hear the sound of shrieking. There is a crunching, booming sound, and moments later, a, cr a cloud of dust billows through the window. Under the table, Mum shouts, trying to lift me into my feet. What about Grandma? I ask, fighting my way towards her armchair. Leave me, Grandma shouts. Get under the table. I try to help her up but she pushes me away with such desperate strength that I end up on my knees again, crawling under the table. Mum puts her arm around me and pulls me close, protecting me with her body. From where we hide, I can see Grandma sitting with her hands folded on her lap, her head bowed, her eyes closed. I know Grandma hates earthquakes from the time Grandpa died. I hope she isn't as scared as me. I hope she remembers that Dad is, is in the strongest building in Jakarta. I hope she remembers that she's indestructible. Rochi told me about earthquakes once. He said they've, they've got nothing to do with the world being hungry, like I thought, or Allah being angry, like Houston said. Rochi said that deep underground, the world is made up of huge rocky plates, and all these plates are moving. They only move a tiny, a tiny bit at a time, but sometimes they get stuck and the pressure builds. Then one day, like today, something gives and they do years and years of moving in one go. I told him that I didn't think such tiny movements could result in something as big as an earthquake, but he swore it was true and I think I believe him now. Finally, the shaking stops. I hear the last few pieces of plaster drop on the floor. Mum makes me wait beneath the table in case there is an aftershock. She rushes over to Grandma and wipes the dust from her hair and clothes. Grandma coughs, growling as she tries to clear the dust from her throat. 
I'm fine, she says, both hands pressed to her chest. It's over now. Grandma's eyes begin to water and the squidgy vein stands out on her forehead. Mum goes to fetch her a drink and as I move I notice the building on my on the opposite of the street through the window. I tilt my head to make it straight but it's not right. I crawl out from under the table. Mum says something but I don't hear it. I can't, can't take my eyes off the window. Shuffling across the room I step outside. The apartment block opposite, the one that's made of the wrong sort of concrete, is half the height it used to be. It looks like a dog that's folded its leg beneath itself. The lower floors have crumpled into one another and the rest of the building leans towards the ground. I step up onto a chunk of concrete in the middle of the road. The morning is already hot but the air is so thick with dust that I can't see the sun. Around me, groups of people cling to each other, wailing at the sight of the destroyed building. Their clothes are white and chalky. Their faces grow and smudged. They look like ghosts. Somehow my apartment block is still standing. Big chunks have fallen from every building for as far as I can see. Each moment brings another person staggering out into the street, until soon the space in front of me is crowded with people trying to find relatives and friends. Their feet kick, to, kick up clouds of dust. My mouth feels like a, de a desert. Among the crying and shrieking, I hear urgent voices, angry voices, but I can't tell what they're saying. I saw a war film once. At the end, a group of planes flew over a town and dropped bombs on the houses. They weren't even the houses of soldiers. It was just families. Old people, grown-ups, children, babies, the bombs kept falling and the towns kept getting smashed, in, smashed to pieces. And all the time there was this music playing, like the music they always play at the end of films when the good guys finally start winning. Except the good guys weren't winning. It was just people being bombed for no reason and left to pick up the pieces. And their streets looked like mine does now. I suddenly think of Rochi, his crumbling room near the slums, and I jumped down from the concrete boulder, turning my back on back to my apartment. Mum still has her arm round Grandma, holding a cup of water to her dusty lips. Grandma isn't drinking. I'm out of breath, even though I haven't run anywhere. Rochi, I managed to say, I have to check. I have to. I have to know. No, Mum says, standing up. It's not safe. But Grandma waves a hand telling me to go, telling mum to let me go. And no, mum knows she's right. She puts her hands on her hips and hangs her head. Just, she waves a hand like grandma and I go. I push my way through the crowds of ghosts, fallen air conditioning units and shop signs and rubbles block the narrow side streets. So I head towards the main road. I race along the pavement, hur hurtling over debris and weaving between toppled scooters. Among all the chaos and destruction, I catch a glimpse of the factory, still standing as though nothing had happened. I turn into a maze of street that leads to Rochi's apartment. The buildings have slumped against each other, spilling chunks of concrete and plaster into narrow lanes. There is a thin track through the wreckage, but as I get closer to the slums, I have to climb over mounds of debris just to keep moving. Eventually, I reach Rochi's street, I clamber over a hill of rubble and skid to a halt. I don't stop because my legs are burning. I don't stop because my lungs feel raw. I don't stop because the cuts on my fingertips and knees are dripping blood. I stop because there aren't any buildings in front of me. I stop because there aren't any people in front of me. I stop because I don't know if I can go on. And then I notice someone standing between the mounds of twisted metal and broken concrete. He is the same colour as the dusty mess around him. And as I get closer, I notice the pale number seven hanging off the back of his shirt. Rochi doesn't turn to look at me when I reach his side. He just stares at the spot where his home used to be. 
A dark stripe cuts through the dust on each cheek like wall paint. I think I must look the same. I reach out and hold Rochi's hand. I just stepped outside, he whispered. I was on my way to the dump. I didn't know. I didn't know this would happen. I squeeze his hand and I hear the soft patter of blood as my fingertip leaks onto the ground. We stand here for a long time. We don't move. Even when the rain comes to wash us clean, my legs don't ache. My shoulders don't burn. You only notice the things that hurt the most. And in my chest, there's a continuous plummeting, like my heart is sinking in the deep, cold ocean. Like someone is driving the knife in deeper and deeper, always twisting, always pushing, never finding the bottom. I hold Roger's hand for so long, it feels as though we've merged. When a muscle twitches, I can't tell who it belongs to. When my finger bleeds, it bleeds with Rochi's blood. I'm sorry, he says eventually. I understand without asking. I'm sorry too. The sky begins to darken. Sirens get louder without getting closer. People drift by, picking through the wreckage, digging. We should go, I say. Come home with me. Rochi shakes his head. Rain drips from his nose and chin. His shirt isn't a faded pink anymore. It's the blood red colour it should be. I don't want to leave, he says. I can't. I look into his face and I wonder if he'll ever be able to stop crying. Or will he just stand here forever, seeping into the rubble? Our hands separate and I take a step towards home, but I turn back before leaving. Whenever you're ready, I say, we'll be waiting for you. Then I go, trudging through muddy streets and over mounds of broken building. In some places people search for survivors, in others they search for things they can eat or burn or sell. Makeshift shelters spring up in the gaps between gaps. When I get home, Mum is sitting at the table, biting her nails and staring at the wall. She doesn't notice me until I speak. Mum, I say. Then I notice the empty chair. Where's Grandma? Oh, buddy, Mum says, and in a flash she's up and hugging me to her chest. She doesn't even seem to notice that I'm soaked through, that I'm bleeding, bleeding on the outside, bleeding on the inside. I don't know how to tell you. She's, she's gone. Grandma's gone. We've lost her. I manage to prise myself away and look up into Mum's eyes. They're red and swollen. She can't have gone, I say. She, she can hardly walk. And she falls asleep too often. Have you checked the street? Nobody. That's where we should look first. I'll go now. Nobody, Mum says, catching my arm as I turn to leave. When I look back, Mum is properly crying, like she's hurt. What's the matter? I ask. She's gone, buddy, Mum sobs. Grandma's dead. But... Grandma's indestructible. She's immune to venom. Once she fell out of a third story window and survived without a scratch. Mum sits down in Grandma's chair. It's a very strange thing to see. She doesn't fit it, fit properly among the cushions. I look down and realise a puddle is, is forming around my feet. My fingertip drips blood onto the rug. But she can't be, I say. That's when the room goes blurry. Like I'm looking at everything at the bottom of a stream. A stream that rushes around me, taking everything with it. The scattered cigarette butts, the rug, Grandma's chair with Mum still sitting in it. Soon I can't even see my feet. My legs, my waist. It feels as though I'm being swept away, submerged, drowning. And there's nothing I can do, nothing to hold on to. And so I let go.